All right, this is the Chapter 14B PowerPoint, more on weather forecasting and analysis. And this time, I'm going to talk a little bit about other forecasting methods that operational meteorologists use in their work, especially those who are employed by the National Weather Service. Um, a typical forecast might be something called a persistence forecast, which is great uh, to a very small extent only. It assumes that future weather will be the same as present weather. Now, this is less accurate after several hours pass by. Now, on a particular summer day in Fresno, where it's clear, like the day was yesterday and the day was, is going to be tomorrow, in the summertime, that may not be such a bad thing. But persistent forecast is one method of uh, forecasting. Uh, then there's a steady state or trend forecast, which basically says this. Current weather systems will move in the same direction and at approximately the same speed as they have been moving, assuming no evidence exists otherwise. Uh, those can also be dangerous down the road because uh, if you're not looking at the evidence, it could be that a weather system may move and then, of course, that'll blow your forecast. Then there's something called the analog method, and this tends to rely on the fact that existing features on weather charts may strongly resemble weather conditions which have occurred some time in the past. This is also called pattern recognition. And actually, uh, this can be very, very useful, especially if you have a significant event, like a major heat wave or maybe a big storm, and somebody maybe at the National Weather Service has worked in that office long enough to remember, well, you know, I remember that big storm back in January of 82, and this uh, pattern that's evolving kind of looks like that. So there's the analog method. Then there are forecasts which are heavily relied on called statistical forecasts. These are made routinely of the various weather elements like temperature, low and high temperature, dew point, sky condition, precipitation, layers of clouds based on the past performance of various computer models. And the products that come from uh, those computer models are called model output statistics, or if you will, uh, MOS. So what I'm about to show you here is the MOS forecast. Actually, uh, this is for a date and time from the 22nd of April uh, to the 25th of April, uh, 2013. This is a MOS guidance from the North American model uh, showing, uh, and actually so for a 60 hour period, the skies are expected to be clear. Uh, it looks like we're expecting uh, on the 24th of April, a min and max of 56 and 85, and then on the 25th of April, a min and max temperature 55 and 84. So you can see what a MOS forecast uh, actually uh, looks like, which is, uh, which, you know, which is actually a, a kind of interesting, just to give you an idea. Such forecasts, when they involve precipitation, will give what's called a numerical probability. So here's the deal. This is the big chance of rain dilemma. When you're watching a TV weathercast or you're getting the weather information from some source, they're going to issue, if precipitation is expected, a percentage. And that is the probability that that precipitation is going to be measurable or not. The percentage of probability means that any random place within the designated forecast area has whatever probability is, whatever percent is, of receiving measurable rain or snow precipitation. Now, whenever the percentage is issued, unless it's designated, it's for steady precipitation. If showers are predicted, that probability represents a percentage of the expected area over which showers will fall. So, if the percentages are low, that means that the forecaster has a fairly low confidence that the precipitation that is expected to fall will actually be measurable. If the probability is high, that means there's a greater confidence that the precipitation that is expected to fall will actually be measurable. So there's a little bit about the chance of rain dilemma. You know, all those people never get it right. They said 20% chance of rain and it rained in my house. Well, maybe if they meant 20% chance of showers, that meant that only 20% of the area would be covered by showers, but you happen to be under that cloud, okay? You know what I'm saying? So you have to really know what they mean when they say chance of. All right, enough said about that topic. Probability forecast can use climatological data to predict the occurrence of an event, such as 30-year averages, such as what we call the, uh, you know, a white a Christmas, uh, for instance. There are maps that show that, the probability of a white Christmas based on 30-year statistical averages. Then there's forecasting by weather types. Using the analog method that we discussed before to look for certain patterns in the large scale, the macro scale and the synoptic scale that recur and produce particular kinds of weather. 
looking to see where the flow of air uh, is coming from. Will it either be from west to east, which is zonal, or meridional, which is from north to south? Looking for the locations of ridges, high pressure ridges, and low pressure troughs. Um, I will say this, and this is not in your textbook, back in the late 1930s and early 1940s, there was a meteorologist who actually started the meteorology department at Caltech in Pasadena by the name of Dr. Irving P. Crick. And he developed a type of forecasting called the synoptic weather types of North America. And basically, it all depended on where the uh, Pacific high pressure system was located. And if you could figure out um, where the Pacific high pressure was located on day one and how it might move, you might be able to figure out the weather for uh, the next three days or maybe the next six days based on five weather types, which were conveniently labeled A, B, C, D, and E. Now, it's all very complicated, but part of the work that Dr. Crick did actually led to the successful weather forecast for D-Day uh, across the English Channel on June 6, 1944. So you may want to do a search for Dr. Irving P. Crick, K-R-I-C-K, and the synoptic weather types of North America, and you may some, find some very interesting stuff, especially relative to the f weather forecast for D-Day, which basically changed the tide of World War II and really changed the world when you think about it. Uh, figure 14.8 is the probability forecast for the odds of a white Christmas happening in different parts of the U.S. Figure 14.9 represents a weather type forecast to show what kind of weather will result in a, uh, from a particular recognizable pattern. Then there is a very short range forecast. Now we're going to talk about forecast with respect to time frame. How far out do you go in time? A very short range forecast is often called the now cast. Usually it's not for more than six hours out at a time. It integrates satellite data, surface weather observations at airports, Doppler radar, human experience, and also pattern recognition. A short range forecast goes out from six hours to two and a half days. It incorporates a number of techniques and data sets and beyond 12 hours relies a lot more heavily on those uh, prognostic charts or progs and the model output statistics, the MOS data that I showed you an example of. Then there's a medium range forecast. That goes out for a period of three days to eight and a half days, and it's entirely almost based on computer derived products like prognostic charts, different models, and the MOS uh, uh, statistics that I showed you earlier. This is often called an extended forecast. A long range forecast goes beyond eight and a half days, and since the computer models do go out about 16 days, I will tell you that beyond day seven or day eight, they often default to climatology or not often reliable. That's a, a realm of time that I often make reference to as fantasy land. Once you go beyond day seven on a model, often the models uh, do uh, revert to uh, the uh, statistical climatological averages. And then the years in, there, is an, uh, there is a unit of the Weather Service called the Climate Prediction Center that issues what's called an outlook, and that's for 30-day and 90-day intervals. Here you see 14.10a uh, and 14.10b. These are examples of 90-day outlooks for precipitation and temperatures, respectively, just showing trends, drier than normal, wetter than normal, warmer than normal, colder than normal. These are issued by the Climate Prediction Center. So these are really not forecasts per se, but we call them outlooks because they go well beyond the range of the kinds of prognostic models that we use that only go out 16 days. They use other methods. Let's talk a little bit about the accuracy and skill of weather forecasting. Now, forecasts that are made for 12 to 24 hours in advance are quite accurate. The forecasts that are made for two to five days out are fairly good. But once you go beyond day seven, like I say, it gets dicey, then you really are out in fantasy land. Now, whether a forecast is right or wrong depends on the criteria for verification. The National Weather Service doesn't just put these forecasts out uh, in a void and then don't go back and look at them. For instance, if a forecast is particularly wrong, so to speak, then they might go back and say, okay, let's go back and look at uh, what was missing in this forecast. What did we miss that caused us to, say, have a blown forecast, uh, so to speak? So let's look a little bit about skill. If you are saying a forecast of no rain tomorrow for a summer day in Fresno, well, that obviously requires no skill because typically it's dry here in the summer. But if you say rain tomorrow for a rain tomorrow 
as opposed to no rain tomorrow for a summer day in Fresno, that does require some skill because rain is such a, a scarce commodity in the summertime in Fresno. It's a very rare occurrence. I think you would all agree. Weather forecasts show skill when they are more accurate than a forecast utilizing only persistence or climatology as methods for forecasting. Now, various time frames of forecasts have increased considerably in skill in recent years to a, due to a whole lot of innovations in the science of weather forecasting. Forecasting large scale events, meaning macro scale or synoptic scale, like high pressures, low pressures, fronts, those forecasts are far more accurate than forecasting precise evolution and movement of small scale, short lived weather systems, like, say, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. The faster computer, computer the, <laughs> let me start again. The faster computers that we have now and better computer modeling of the atmosphere, global circulation models or GCMs, are doing a whole lot better job today than they did yesterday, say several dozen years ago. The seven day forecasts that are now issued show about as much skill as a three day forecast did just a decade ago. So that's a big improvement. A three day forecast that's issued today for the development and uh, movement of a major low pressure system shows more skill today than a 36 hour forecast for that same low pressure system 15 years ago. So obviously a lot more accuracy and skill are um, coming to the table now because of recent scientific innovations in weather forecasting. Now the next few slides uh, refer to figures 11, uh, excuse me, 14, 11 and 14, 12 on page 413 uh, using uh, forecasts around the US based on this surface and upper air pattern I'm about to show you. I recommend you turn your page book, uh, your textbook to page 413 while we discuss this. These maps represent a day in late winter. So here is the surface map from a day in late winter. It's very simplified. You only have one isobar around each high and low. All right, green is rain, pink is mixed precipitation or freezing rain. Uh, white is snow, and the area is void of color shading uh, or no precipitation. Here's the upper air pattern showing a big high pressure ridge over the west coast, a low pressure trough in the central US, a low pressure trough in New England, and then a high over the Great Lakes, an upper level high. Uh, the uh, west coast shows a strong high pressure over the uh, states uh, adjacent to the Pacific. That often will mean in winter time a very stable weather pattern with no mid-latitude cyclones entering the west from the eastern Pacific Ocean. Uh, this can mean sunny weather in mountain areas and cold, damp air trapped in valleys, which is often conducive to widespread fog here in the Central Valley. This can often be a pattern meaning dry Santa Ana winds in Southern California. The Great Plains, it shows the polar jet stream on this map going east of the Rockies in the upper air map. Um, it's showing on the surface a stationary front roughly along the continental divide that separates bitterly cold continental polar air over the plains from milder air to the west. This can produce extremely low wind chills over the plains and intensify a surface low pressure over the area of the state of Missouri which is projected on that surface map I showed you to move northeastward. This could lead to blizzard conditions over Minnesota, uh, snow developing over eastern Nebraska, grass, Nebraska, eastern South Dakota, and also Iowa. This could also lead to strong gusty winds and hazardous waves over the Great Lakes, along with rain at first, which will then change to snow. The weather depicted on figure dot 1411 and figure dot uh, 1412 is also conducive for severe thunderstorms in the yellow shaded area in figure 14.11, roughly along the Mississippi River from south of Memphis to north of St. Louis. And one element that forecasters use is the study of Cape values, which we studied in the chapter on thunderstorm, convective available potential energy, which helps us to figure out where thunderstorms may possibly occur. This is a chart from your book, a table, which shows values of Cape and what kinds of severe weather or magnitude of severe weather they could be associated with. In the southeastern United States in this map, as a warm front becomes stationary over Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, you could get warm humid air going over the top of cold air on the surface, which could produce freezing rain. And if the surface is cold, ice can accumulate on those surfaces. Hot and dry weather is forecast for Florida as surface high pressure and sinking air dominate there. In the northeast, there is a potential for a nor'eastern storm on this map, but it's not sure whether this precipitation will be rain or snow. 
This ends the PowerPoint for 14b.